Oh, director. Here. Delinda, Here. Director Delinda Fisher. Here. Director Sarah Gurney. Here. Director Ariel Kelly. Here. Director Mark Landman. He's in the attendees. Oh. oh bring him over. Uh, Director Sandra Lowe. Here. Director David Rabbit. I don't see. Uh, Director Rosa Reynoso. Here. Vice Chair Linda Hopkins. Present. And Chair Chris Rogers. And it looks like yep. David's jumping on. And I'm just seeing Director uh, David Rabbit joining the meeting right now. And Drew, our, my audio wasn't working, so I'm assuming you you got me. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I, voted, I brought you in as present. And I believe we have a quorum, Chair Rogers. Excellent. I actually think we have a full vote once uh, Mark Landman gets promoted. Let's go ahead and start with our public comment for a non-agenda item. Do you have a comment on something not on today's item, but that falls within our jurisdiction? Go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Okay, and I see one member of the public who has their hand raised, um, Eris Weaver. Um, Eris, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew, and um, thank you, Board. I'm Eris Weaver, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, you've probably already heard now and seen seen quite a bit of it in the paper about um, the recent death of a cyclist a couple of weeks ago. In the five years I've been tracking bicycling collisions and, and deaths in the county, this is the first one that happened not on a road. Um, but rather on the class one paths that are supposed to be the safe places for us. I've been in a lot of communication with uh, supervisors and with regional parks and looking at how, uh, what can be done differently so that we don't have other folks injured um, uh, in this way by, by hitting these bollards that are put on the trails with the intention of keeping us safe by keeping cars off, but may cause more problems than they're preventing. Um, I will be, um, uh, I have been, as I write about the county, looking at, at bollards in the, in the different trails and places. And so we'll probably be bringing this to the attention of, the, of those of you from the cities and what things are there in your jurisdiction. I know um, uh, Director Kelly's already looking at, at getting it on the Healdsburg uh, City Council to deal with the bollards that are on the Foss Creek path. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get this issue resolved in a way that uh, improves safety. Thank you. Thank you, Eris. Uh, Chair Rogers, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak on item two, and I also did not receive any pre-submitted public comments. All right, thanks, Drew. We'll go to our consent calendar then. We have item 3.1, it's our meeting notes from July 11th. Item 3.2, it's our continued authorization for a teleconference meeting with AB 361. Item 3.3 is our quarterly financial report. And item 3.4, our resolution of uh, commendation for Janet Spillman. And I'm, I suspect we'll have a couple of words to say about that. Item 3.5, our cooperative agreement with FCTA and Public Works for Railroad Avenue and Pengrove corridor study. And item 3.6, it's our cooperative agreement between FCTA and Caltrans for Santa Rosa Route or State Route 121, 8th Street East intersection improvement. Uh, item 3.7, our amendment to agreement RCPA 22003 and RCPA 21001, uh, and item 3.8 on carbon sequestration, uh, our agreement with our Sonoma County Ag Preservation and <laughs> Open Space District. So board, I'll go ahead and bring it back and see if there's any questions on the consent calendar. Move to approve. We have a motion. We'll also take public comment just a moment here. And uh, before I do that, Suzanne, I wanted to turn it over to you and see if you had anything you wanted to say on item 3.4. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I see Janet is uh, has been able to join us today. Uh, so Janet Spillman, our Director of Planning, retired. Uh, Officially, it'll be in a few weeks, but she is on vacation now and enjoying life. Um, and I just wanted to, um, I don't know, 
it's hard to thank her for all of the work that she's done for us over the years. Um, she is truly going to be missed. And the resolution that you just approved, um, commending her service to the SETA, tries to lay out a little bit of what those accomplishments include. And um, she wrote our first conference of transportation plan, our first active transportation plan. Um, she's been integral in all of our regional activities uh, when it came to planning and um, is one of the first people I hired when I got this job. So it's, uh, plus she's been a good friend for, for years. Um, so just appreciate the boards taking up her resolution today and uh, expressing the appreciation for her years of service, uh, 22 years with the SCTA, and um, we're going to miss her. So thank you. All right, any other comments or questions from the board on the consent calendar? I'd like to second the motion, Mr. Chair, and uh, just express my thanks and congratulations. Um, and and sorry, Suzanne, that you're 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 losing one of your partners in crime. So I know it's it's hard for everyone, but um, but also just uh, real um, heartfelt congratulations to Janet for all you've done for all of our communities and your hard work. And we'll go to the vice chair. I just wanted to um, echo that gratitude and thank you so much for all of your work on bringing forward a true countywide vision. Um, so thank you very much for your dedication and your service. And then um, I also had a question that might be best uh, directed to council. I was just wondering if I should recuse myself from the um, item on the Ag and Open Space funding since we did, that was item 3.8, um, since we did approve that at the Board of Supervisors. I thought my colleagues might be interested in the answer to that question as well. Uh, I think Corey is on, so we can check with her, but I don't think that's been a problem in the past, but let me double check with her. All right, while we find that answer, let's go to Director Gurney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I wanted to say to Janet personally how much I've appreciated her professionalism. One of the delights in being a public servant volunteer like me uh, is to have someone be so constant you know, just so constant right there with the answers, um, very dignified and respectful and helpful. Janet, I don't think I've said enough or often enough too, how much I've appreciated your work and your long career. Thank you for your service. Yeah, and I just want to express that sentiment as well. It's been great to work with you and we're really excited for you. Obviously it's a huge change for the team as well. Uh, but you're one of the uh, the OGs, as Suzanne calls you, uh, <laughs> with the SCTA, RCPA, and and so I hope you're you're proud of the 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 when you look back on everything that you've been able to work on and where we've come uh, up to this point. Uh, I'm going to go to public comment on the consent calendar, uh, and then I'll bring it back. And if you want to say a few words, uh, you're welcome to as well, Janet. Uh, and uh, we'll get that answer for for the vice chair while we are at public comment. May I say something now? Is that now the right time? <laughs> yeah, feel free. Okay. Yeah, it's been, SCTA, RCPA is an outstanding organization and I have been uh, profoundly lucky and proud of working at the SCTA, RCPA under Suzanne all these years. It's been a great learning experience. It's been a great experience overall. And, um, I can't, I, I can't thank you all enough. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and then Drew, I didn't see any hands. So we will keep moving forward. We had a motion from Director Kelly and a second from Director Bagby. Uh, let's also get the answer if we can from Corey. If Corey's able to unmute and talk. Corey, are you there? Mm -hmm. I have been having a little bit of Zoom difficulties today. Uh, I, could you repeat the question and I will attempt to answer. So the question was just um, item 3.8, which was based on the funding that the Board of Supervisors um, awarded 
and a sort of agreement with Ag and Open Space if we need to recuse ourselves or if we're okay uh, to vote on that item. Um, given that it, there would be sufficient uh, folks able to vote without you, it, I kind of leave it up to you for this, that this point, it will be before the board of supervisors next, uh, actually tomorrow, the same agreement. Um, so it's one of those where the funding has already been allocated and approved, and this is just simply the execution of the agreement to allow the funds to be transferred. I might stay on the safe side and just put it on one of the two days and not both, but thank you. So thank exactly. you. Exactly. Thanks. All right, Drew, can you please call the vote? Certainly. Director Backby. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aye. Director Corsi. Yes, but I'll abstain on, is it four? 3.8, I think. Sorry, 3.8. Uh, uh, Director Elward. That's it. Director Fisher? Yes. Oh, yes, sorry. I'm having an issue here too with my uh, my connection, but yes. Good. Thank you. And then I heard the yes from Director Fisher. Director Gurney? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Landman? Aye. Director Lowe? Aye. Director Rabbit? So I, with an exception, uh, uh, exemption on 3.8. Uh, Director Reynosa? Aye. Vice Chair Hopkins? Yes, with an abstention on 3.8. And Chair Rogers? Aye. Uh, we say that motion passes. Okay. Uh, Suzanne, do you want to go on to item 4.1? I do. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just getting organized. Um, so item 4.1 is the funding program uh, that you heard from us Two meeting, or last meeting, but two months ago, uh, you uh, heard a presentation on the draft proposed program. And so Shauna and David are here today mm -hmm. with the uh, final program uh, for your consideration for adoption. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Ooh, can you make sure I've got the right one showing? No, uh, swap. Swap again. Swap. <laughs> yeah, right there under display. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we're good. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, directors. Uh, we're here today to talk about the final draft recommendations for the SCTA funding program. It was a quick summary. The SCTA started this process about a year ago with a call for projects and uh, a call for the top five priority projects from each jurisdiction. In response, SCTA received 65 applications. Given the timing of some of the funding sources, SCTA needed to program some projects early with state transportation improvement program and local partnership program funding. That money went to the four projects listed here. In addition to the STIP and LPP, other recent programming included the Safe and Seamless Mobility Quick Strike Program. Six jurisdictions were selected in Sonoma County to receive that funding. The funds were intended for projects that were ready to go and easily deliverable. As we reported in July, the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program was seeking applications earlier than when SCTA anticipated programming projects for the One Bay Area Grant Cycle 3. So SCTA partnered with the transit agencies to submit several of the projects that had been submitted for the funding program as a TERSIP grant application, totaling more than $24 million. Awards were announced in July and our application was awarded its full request. Back in June, Staff reported the process that we used to evaluate the remaining projects that had been submitted for the SCTA funding program cycle one. All the projects were evaluated by staff and received a consensus team score using criteria that were recommended by the advisory committees and approved by the board. The evaluation criteria address established goals of Plan Bay Area, the comprehensive transportation plan, the Sonoma County climate mobilization strategy, and Go Sonoma. 
the criteria evaluated benefits to equity priority communities, potential mode shift, safety, community engagement, emission reduction, and project readiness, among others. We started with ranking each of the projects in order of the raw score and selected projects with a benchmark of 95 points minimum. Using that method alone, the qualifying project requests still exceeded the available total funding that we, that we had. So we developed different scenarios that further reduced the number of projects and also provided some geographic equity to ensure that the improvements uh, would benefit all of the areas in the county. We were of course able to fund a number of the transit projects with the TERSIP grant. So those projects were able to be eliminated from further consideration. July board meeting, staff have also reviewed and evaluated the MTC applications for the One Bay Area Grant Cycle 3 for all eligible projects. Taken together with the previously submitted SCTA funding program applications, staff have assembled final draft recommendations. The recommendations were presented to the TAC and CAC last month. TAC approved or recommended approval and the CAC did not have a quorum vote, but the majority of the whole supported staff recommendations as well. All projects proposed for funding in June are still proposed for funding now. The details of the staff recommendation have expanded to include the proposed funding sources and to identify which projects will be submitted to MTC's competitive county program for OBAG 3. And for a summary of the recommendations, I'll hand it over to David Ripperda. Thank you, Shauna. So on the next slide, we have a close-up of the table one that is included in your staff report. I apologize, it's rather small text. But as you can see in the table, we list each of the projects that the board previously saw as part of the draft recommendations. As John mentioned, they have not changed. But the only thing that has changed is now we're recommending specific colors of money for each project. For some of the projects, they are recommending projects uh, for funding from Go Sonoma for our future sales tax. Other projects are recommended funding through the state local partnership program, and also projects that are highlighted in green are recommended for funding through MTC's OBAG3 uh, program, which includes funding from two different funding sources from the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Program and the Service Transportation Program. Both those programs have certain requirements that only some of the projects are able to meet. We had requested applications from several other projects that were not highlighted in green, but however, we feel these are the best projects to submit for those two funding sources to MTC. Once the board approves those projects for submittal to MTC, they have to go through a competitive process. And so we feel these projects will compete the best in all the region to receive federal funds for those projects. We are also recommending other projects for funding through Measure M, as they are eligible for those types of Measure M dollars. And also only two of the projects are recommended for funding through Orange Park mitigation fees. And as we'll discuss the next few slides, so the turn back over to Shauna, we'll be coming back to you in February to finalize these funding recommendations. Shauna? Oh, and real quick, uh, we'll, we have two pie charts that we showed you previously showing the different percentages going to different types of projects as part of this funding program. Uh, shown in this pie chart, approximately 45% of the funds are going to bicycle pedestrian projects, about 4% to transit operations, 35% to projects that improve traffic operations, and then about 16% of the funding for pavement. And then on the next slide, when combined with the TERSIP grant that was recently awarded, this changes the percentages somewhat. As you can see, between TERSIP and also our previous quick strike and STIP funding, Transit capital is shown as 28% of our overall funding that has been programmed in the last year and a half. Uh, bicycle investing uh, 38%, pavement 12%, traffic operations 20%, and 2% for transit operations. And with that, I'll turn back over to Shana. David. The staff is seeking approval from the board on the final draft staff recommendations. Recommendations remain draft until MTC adopts the OBAG three county program. Once the MTC program has been adopted, staff will adjust the final SCTA funding program list if necessary and seek final approval from the SCTA board in early 2023. We also wanted to provide a brief update on the public engagement that has occurred since the board approved the, the public engagement plan in July. I'd also like to thank Ross Clendenin for all the work he's done on the public engagement, which has been robust. 
Per the plan, letters were sent out to a lengthy list of community-based organizations and tribes to solicit input on the pro proposed projects. Letters were sent by email and US Post. Follow-up phone calls and emails were used to ensure receipt of the original letters and to answer any questions or provide any other, uh, provide another medium for input. In addition to the letters, a public survey was posted to the SCTA website and all social media outlets to further solicit feedback on the proposed projects and provide alternate avenues for public engagement. The survey was made available in Spanish and English with accessibility alternatives. A summary of all the responses we've received to date has been posted on the SCTA website and continues to be updated as any new responses are received. This slide shows our delivery schedule. So here we are in September, bringing you the final draft recommendations. And also this month, after the board considers the approval of these recommendations, uh, we will be required to submit our OBAG 3 recommendations to MTC. Between October and December, MTC staff will evaluate our OBAG 3 nominations. And then in December, MTC staff will start talking to the county transportation authorities to discuss their preliminary staff recommendations. And then in January, the commission will approve the county and local program of projects. And then in February, if any adjustments are needed, we will bring back the final SCTA funding program recommendations to the board. Also in February, all the jurisdictions that are um, approved for one Bay Area grant cycle three funds will need to input their fund uh, information into the transportation improvement program. And that's something that staff works with your staff on to achieve. Finally, MTC reached out to the County Transportation Authorities seeking input on how delivery issues should affect the points awarded to OBAG-3 applications. This slide is a screenshot of the Sonoma County jurisdictions shown in the table provided by MTC. This and additional information is included in your agenda packet. The only delivery issue was with the City of Sonoma and the funding that is proposed for the Sonoma project is not one Bay Area grant cycle three, so will not be affected by the status. MTC is proposing to deduct one point per delivery issue on applications from jurisdictions identified. And as is shown in the third column, there are no delivery issues with the Sonoma County jurisdictions proposed for OBAG three funding. Our presentation and I'll turn it back over to the board. Thank you so much, Shauna. Do we have any questions from the board? All right, I see no hands. So, Drew, let's go, ahead and go to our public comment on this item. Um, I currently do not see any members of the public with their hands up, nor did I receive any pre submitted public comments on this item. All right, let's go ahead and take down the presentation for a moment and see if I can get a motion and a second on the table. I'll move approval. It's a Petaluma. All right, Director Fisher with the motion. I'd be happy to second that, Mr. Chair. This is Katari. And Director Landman with the second. Is there any additional discussion from the board? All right, Drew, let's call the vote. Director Bagby. Aye. Director Corsi? Yes. Director Elward? Yes. Director Fisher? Yes. Director Gurney? Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Landman? Aye. Director Lowe? Aye. Director Rabbit? Aye. Director Reynosa? Aye. Vice Chair Hopkins? Yes. And Chair Rogers? Aye. And that motion passes. All right, Suzanne, let's move on to item 4.2, the report item. All right, um, item 4.2 is, sorry, my screen jumped. Um, Chris Barney is here to give a report out on the status of the vehicle miles traveled reduction calculator that has been in development in partnership with your planning departments and public works folks uh, and our consultant team. So I will hand it over to Chris for a presentation. Thanks, Suzanne, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen screen here. All 
All right, Drew, can you confirm that we're seeing the right slide? Yes, confirm that we're seeing the right slide. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm happy to report out that the Sonoma County VMT mitigation and reduction calculator was released in August. Uh, the calculator provides a tool that local staff and developers can use to estimate the effectiveness of different mitigation measures aimed at reducing vehicle miles traveled. I'll be providing a background on the project and then we'll turn things over to Drew Levitt from Fair and Peers to provide a high level walkthrough on the tool. Senate Bill 743 eliminated delay, congestion, and level of service as a CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act metric in an effort to reduce emissions, promote multimodal travel, and to encourage infill development. The Governor's Office of Planning and Research, or OPR, was tasked with determining an alternative metric, and they identified VMT as the preferred way for measuring transportation environmental impacts. SB 743 changes where significant transportation impacts are generally found to occur and shifts the finding of these impacts from built up central areas out to less dense areas on the edge of communities. It changes the focus of mitigation from congestion reduction to total travel and BMT. And again, uh, shifts the mitigation focus from congestion reduction to VMT reduction. Uh, the implementation deadline for SB 743 was back in July 1st of 2020. Congestion is pretty easy to see. You can actually walk out to a congested roadway and see uh, cars backed up and taking a long time to get to where they're intending to go. Uh, but VMT is a higher level regional metric that is harder to see and harder to measure. It represents the number of trips a person or household make in a day, as well as the length of those trips. So if a person makes five trips in a day and each of those trips is 10 miles long, that person would generate 50, v 50 daily VMT. Uh, VMT measures the amount of vehicle travel happening in a city, region, county, or other area, and is often expressed as a per person or per employee efficiency metric. VMT measures total travel activity and not congestion and captures higher level and regional impacts of travel. So the state through OPR has asked us to consider um, which method of assessing travel impacts is better by providing some examples. Uh, consider a 45 minute commute trip through mostly uncongested roadways, traveling at higher speeds, with a short five minute portion of that trip traveling through congestion at the end. And compare that to a much shorter commute trip of 20 minutes, which is less than half of that first trip, which travels through more congested roadways. So when considering level of service, the longer trip with less congestion would receive a good level of service grade because there's less congestion and the shorter, more congested trip would receive a bad level of service grade. Accessibility is certainly worse and VMT emissions and time loss would be higher for that longer trip. And the shorter, more congested trip represents less travel time and time loss sitting in a vehicle and fewer miles traveled along with associated travel impacts like fuel con consumption and emissions. OPR has also provided some additional benefits as using VMT as a metric to measure transportation impacts, including things like making it, e making it easier to develop near transit or in infill lo locations and areas, making it easier to implement bicycle, pedestrian, and transit improvements, streamlining development process for local serving retail and services, uh, addressing, addressing congestion at the regional versus local scale, reducing future road maintenance needs, improving public health and safety, and reducing greenhouse gas and other emissions. So what's SETA's role in SB 743 implementation? SETA is not generally a lead agency, so we aren't implementing SB 743 directly, but we're able to provide resources and technical support to the local jurisdictions that are. Uh, the support's mostly technical and focused on data, modeling, and forecasting, and includes things like sharing information and providing education. We have standing items on uh, the technical advisory and planning advisory committees uh, where we can share information on implementation and successes and challenges people are having um, at implementing SB 743 and considering the MT. 
SCDA produ produces and hosts VMT screening maps showing high and low VMT generating areas. Uh, those are available on our website. Uh, the travel model and other data resources are available for estimating VMT for projects and setting local policy. And finally, we've just wrapped up the development of the Sonoma County VMT mitigation and reduction calculator, uh, which can be used by local staff and developers to determine effective VMT mitigation approaches for projects. The process for analyzing VMT for projects is fairly in-depth, but here's a high-level summary of the basic steps that are required to analyze project-level VMT. OPR has recommended that certain low VMT projects can be screened out and don't need to be analyzed. Projects that may be screened, projects may be screened based on project size, project type, location in a low VMT area, or using other screening criteria which identify uh, other low VMT projects. If a VMT analysis is required, project VMT needs to be calculated using a travel model, trip generation formulas, or other VMT calculation methods, which um, people preparing traffic studies are very familiar with. Next, project VMT is compared to local VMT thresholds. If the project generates VMT above this threshold, VMT needs to be mitigated. Mitigation can potentially reduce VMT impacts below the VMT thresholds. Local jurisdictions requested that SETA staff lead the development of a tool that could be used to quantify the effectiveness of these VMT mitigations. And this tool is the result of that work. The Sonoma County VMT Mitigation and Reduction Tool is a spreadsheet-based tool built on applications, of, applications developed for the San Diego region and Alameda County. It allows the user to enter project type and location and estimate VMT reductions using information from the Sonoma County Travel Model and VMT and Greenhouse Gas Reduction Research, including the paper shown on this slide, uh, the 2021 CAPCOA Handbook for Analyzing Greenhouse Gas Emission Reductions. A project steering committee made up of local planning and engineering staff help guide the tool development and improve it and get it to where uh, the final release product uh, was. The tool was released at a countywide online training session on August 25th, and the tool and associated documentation are available on the SETA website. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Drew Levitt from Fair and Peers to provide an overview of the tool. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, directors. Uh, let me walk really quickly through the process that we took to get to the delivery of this tool. Um, it's important to note we're, we're building on prior art here. So uh, the San Diego Association of Governments or SANDAG developed its own VMT reduction calculator tool. Fair and Peer built a VMT reduction calculator for at the Alameda CTC. Uh, and Fair and Peers also has an internal tool called TDM Plus. So we drew on those existing tools to deliver uh, a sophisticated yet uh, updated tool for Sonoma County. Um, we, we, via the steering committee, were able to understand the desires of local stakeholders with respect to which VMT reduction strategies to include, especially strategies relevant to Sonoma County. Um, we did a iterative process of development and receiving comment on draft tools. So we're pleased to have reached this point and to be able to deliver the final tool. Uh, also, along with the final tool, we've provided uh, some documentation. There's a design document. There, of course, also is a link to the, um, the 2021 CAPCOA report that Chris mentioned. And we also provided a project worksheet as a supporting document that kind of ties back to that flow chart that, that Chris outlined. So um, let's, let's jump forward to the next slide and we'll show the project worksheet at the end. Um, so the, the, key, the key term when it comes to VMT reduction calculators is that substantial evidence, that sort of concept from CEQA litigation. Um, so the all of the strategies in the Sonoma County VMT reduction calculator are backed by peer reviewed research. And you'll actually see in the screenshots that we've prepared for you that each strategy has citations to the literature within the strategies overview in the tool itself. Um, such that that evidence is, is right there. And we think that that really increases the robustness of the tool itself and of the, the ultimate outputs. Uh, we also imported data from the SCTA countywide travel model. 
such that when you select a project location and you do so by, by identifying which transportation analysis zone the project is located in, then that automatically brings in local data on travel mode share, on average trip length, and on other local variables that such that the, the effectiveness of each strategy is keyed to the specific location within the county of the project. Um, and this is something that may change over time. So this it's possible, Chris uh, has the, the know-how to update this over time as the SCTA model sees refinements and as, as land use conditions change, it's possible to bring in those new land use uh, outputs into the tool. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there are a number of strategies included in this tool. I'm not going to touch on all of them right now. Um, you can see them all on this and the next slide, as well as of course in the tool itself. But I'll just note the macro level categories of strategies that are included and, and maybe give an example or two of each. So there are certain strategies that apply at the project scale, which is to say that they they are seen by the literature as affecting VMT associated with the project itself. And then there are other strategies that are effective at the community scale, which is to say that they may reduce VMT generated by a given project, but also reduce background VMT in the community or neighborhood or city in which that project is located. And we'll, we'll look at that on the next slide and think about it. But so among project scale strategies, there are three main buckets. There are land use oriented strategies, um, for example, the literature indicates that the residential or employment density of a project is tied to its VMT. So those are some of those in there. There's also strategies related to transit-oriented development um, and, and other land use measures. There's a whole suite of trip reduction programs. These are sort of your classic transportation demand management or TDM strategies. These are all aimed at the employer, the, the employee commute trip. And so uh, some of them include holistic trip reduction programs, which may be either voluntary or mandatory. And then there's a kind of a la carte approach as well, such that, you know, if you wanted to say that, that uh, let's say you have a commercial development and you're going to mandate that the, the employer employers at your site would need to provide a rideshare program or provide say bike parking of some kind or an employer sponsored van pool. Those are the sort of strategies that fall into the trip reduction programs category. And then finally on the project scale strategies side, we have questions of parking supply and parking pricing. So one might limit the total supply of parking. That strategy tends to be effective only in land use contexts where there isn't abundant parking just across the street, as it were. Uh, similarly, there are also measures that have to do with pricing parking, both by unbundling it from the cost of, of a dwelling unit in a residential development or by pricing the parking at a development. Let's go to the next slide and we can talk a little bit about the community scale strategies, which generally have to do with the broad theme of, of neighborhood design and sort of micro mobility supply in the neighborhood. So this can, this can look like installing a single bike facility. There can be the expansion of an entire network of bike facilities. Uh, there are a number of micro mobility options, as I mentioned, including a car share program, as well as uh, conventional or electric bike share, uh, as well as scooter share. Um, and finally, pedestrian network improvements. Those can be, you know, filling gaps in the sidewalk network in, a, in an area. It, it's with these examples, it's maybe a little bit easier to see how these are strategies where if you provide these amenities both within and surrounding the project, that's how these strategies can start to reduce, to, to help background trips, trips not generated by the project itself, change uh, away from higher VMT options and, and reduce community VMT. And then there, are, finally, there are some strategies related to transit, including extending the, the time span of the day in which transit service is operating, increasing the frequency of transit service, um, providing bus rapid transit and uh, reducing transit fares. Uh, so a number of these as well. And again, in theory, improvements to transit would benefit not only the project who's VMT reduction program is paying for those benefits uh, or for those improvements, but also the, the community at large. Let's go on to the next slide. And we actually have a few screenshots of the tool. We're not going to do a live demo, but I do encourage you to visit the web page and check it out. Um, the tool is, is intended to be as, as simple as possible, but not simpler, as, as Albert Einstein may have said. Um, so you start at the, at the front of it, you, you decide, you define which transportation analysis zone the project is located in. And that, that blue text there is actually a link to a web map that, 
contains the TAZs. So if you're not already intimately familiar with the TAZ boundaries of Sonoma County, which I know you all are, you can quickly see that map and, and decide that there. And then from there, you jump into one or another or several of the approximately 30 strategies that are included in the tool. Let's go to the next slide and we'll actually see an example of one of those strategies. So this is strategy T1 and that the number here, T1, that, that corresponds to its number in the CAPCOA 2021 manual. So that makes it as easy as possible to, to sort of cross-reference the, the supporting document. Um, in this case, this is the increased residential density strategy. And you can see that this is a strategy that includes the green cell there is a mandatory user input that if you want to make use of the strategy, you have to populate that with some information. And then the orange cell is one where there is a default assumption given, but if you have better or more locally focused information than what is already in the tool, you can actually swap that in there. Um, and then there are formulas working behind the scenes such that you know, the ratio of the density of this development to the density of a typical development is calculated, and then an elasticity is applied, and finally a change in VMT um, is calculated. And this is one also, you'll notice up in the upper left that each strategy notes what its locational context is, its scale of application, that sort of project versus community that I mentioned before. Also the type of VMT affected, we'll see a little bit more about that in one second. And finally, what I do wanna call your attention to is that each strategy has a maximum VMT reduction. And as this strategy in the slide is configured, we actually are up against that max. And so those are sort of guardrails to ensure that no one strategy gets too out of control and starts forecasting VMT reductions that are, are plainly implausible. Uh, so you've configured this strategy, maybe you've configured some others as well. Let's go on to the next slide and then we can see what you will see at the at the back end. So there's a results tab that aggregates up all of the strategies that were configured into these different pots of VMT. So you can see at that top line there, that probably corresponds to that uh, increased residential density strategy. And then you can also see that some trip reduction programs have been configured as well. And we're, we're looking at something like a 4% reduction in employee commute trip VMT as well. Uh, so those 11 buckets up top uh, provide a, a medium scale summary. And then down below the high level VMT reduction summary is a little bit more of a macroscopic view that just collapses it as much as possible into all the unique combinations of scale, be that project site or plan community, and then the different types of VMT to which those reductions can apply. So project generated trips, that's just all the trips generated by the project. Um, and then, you know, all employer trip reduction programs typically apply only to employee commute trips. Similarly, there are some distinctions in the types of community level of VMT that a given strategy may, may reduce. So we, we have the high level VMT reduction summary. And the question then is, where do we go with that? So on the next slide, we can actually see a quick screenshot of the supporting project worksheet. And everything on here is, is totally made up. I, I made this up, but this is an example of uh, this this gets to the broader workflow that, that Chris had noted. Um, at the top part of this cell, you can see that based on the project's VMT and uh, employment and population, that there are certain VMT metrics that exceed the hypo hypothetical local thresholds. Again, all of this is made up. But you can see that that line there, you know, significant VMT impact up top says yes, and it directs the user to use the VMT reduction calculator tool we just looked at. Then you can more or less just copy in the results of that high level VMT summary into the VMT reduction section in the middle. And then at the bottom, you can see that it has applied those reductions to the relevant pots of VMT. It's recalculated the different VMT metrics, common VMT metrics that many jurisdictions have chosen to adopt. And in this case, those reductions from the calculator did prove sufficient to mitigate that particular VMT impact. So very quick look at the tool itself and at the, the supporting project worksheet. Um, but uh, on the next slide, you can see that all of the, what we just shared is live at, at the URL on your screen now. Um, I, I do encourage you to visit there and you know, check the tool, check the design document, check the project worksheet. Um, it has been a pleasure working with Chris Barney and with SCTA on this project. Um, and Chris and I both stand ready to, to receive any questions that you all may have. Um, so I guess, Chris, let's go to the next slide. Perhaps we can linger there and see whether there are any questions. 
Great, thanks, Drew. And I, I'd just like to say that the, the link to the tool and documentation are all also available at the end of the staff report in the agenda. Um, and you can search for VMT and SB743 on the SETA website, and that'll get you there as well. So with that, um, turn things back over to you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you so much, Chris and Drew. Really appreciate it. I see a couple of hands. We'll start with uh, Director Reynosa. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for the presentation. Something we really need. Uh, it's been a topic at, in Windsor uh, for a few meetings now. Uh, but my question is, you mentioned the supporting project worksheet is, so is this tool something the developers put together? I'm just trying to understand how it's gonna be used. Is it something you see developers bringing to the planning commission How, or is it something that staff at the town of Windsor plugs in? How do you see this working? Yeah, thank you for that. that question. Um, that's definitely something that the local jurisdiction would need to decide what they prefer. Um, it could work either way. Uh, the tool and supporting documentation are all available on our website now, so the developer certainly can go use it. Um, or if a jurisdiction would prefer having staff actually do the calculations and apply that, it could work either way. So um, with that, you know, there are a lot of complexities in the tool and, you know, I'm always happy to answer questions and help local staff and uh, other folks that are that are trying to apply it as well. So we've tried to document it a lot, but are ready to help out with implementation however we can as well. Thank you. Yep. Director Bagby. Oh, great, thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks, um, Thanks for a, a, a great presentation. I just want just a couple of clarifying, um, well, one clarifying question and a comment. Um, on the slide where you brought up the, the transportation examples, um, I didn't see um, any capture of uh, the VMT benefits for, for rail extensions. I just wondering if that's in the tool and it just wasn't brought up here. So if you could answer that and then I kind of have a broader question for, for staff. You want to tackle that one, Drew? Sure. Thanks, Chris. And thanks yeah. for the question, Director Bagby. Um, yeah, the the tool is designed, we, in, we envision probably primarily will be used with respect to land use projects uh, and proposed projects. Um, there are, yeah, so that's, you know, most of the language in the tool is, you know, what what's the main land use type of the, of the project? Um, of course, for certain, yes, rail extensions and other Kind of transit extensions do reduce VMT uh, to an extent. Those some of the strategies in the tool actually more or less directly address that. Um, you know, be that transit network extension. Um, however, this there are certain edge cases. You know, the story of VMT is that you know in in theory it's simple and in practice it's less simple. And so this may be one of those edge cases where a or an off model calculation of okay, well if we extend rail, you know, what are the new catchment areas of those rail stations? You know, there are there are a variety of methodologies that, that are commonly used to gauge the market potential and, and the uptake of different rail projects. And some of those may be more appropriate than certain strategies in the tool. Um, so I'd say you can get probably part of the way there, but a custom analysis of, of a full-blown heavy rail extension might be more appropriate in some cases. Yeah, Drew, and you you actually hit on my kind of my follow up. It's more of a policy question amongst the board, and for probably for further discussion on the staff. I'm I'm, I'm as a former planning commissioner, I'm actually very happy to see a, a transition to this methodology. Um, I guess my um, it, it's it's more of a rhetorical question, or my or my concern is around um, we're still so. I don't know if we're so volatile around the return to work. I think that, you know, we, we received a report at SMART saying that, you know, the, the analysis is that our return to work rates are, they're kind of the new, we're, we're at the new normal. So I think that we're, we're seeing um, our, our Bay Area traffic patterns have kind of normalized for now. And I guess my question was, um, are the kind of the, the new patterns taken into account by the model and I kind of see this as it's a it's a real projection tool for for cities and communities. And so, if I mean, and Drew, if you wanted to um, to comment again, 
to kind of reiterate how how confident are you about the improvement the improved level of this tool in our planning process because one of the things that's just so i think that's so frustrating for city folks and county folks is that in so many ways our planning for housing and our planning for transportation were were siloed and this is I see this as a significant step forward in kind of bringing those considerations together where they they need to be. But um, and and how I'm, I guess my my the base of my question is how much should we rely on this? And then you kind of commented on it that for heavy rail we we need additional analysis. So could you tease that out a little bit for me because that's really the the heart of my that's at the heart of my concern. Sure, yeah, thank you for the follow-up question. I would say that to the question of, of how telecommuting is going to affect VMT, that's a great question. And that's obviously, you know, we at Fair and Peers are by no means the only ones who have been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of tracking of that. And that's sort of the, the great question of our age in some ways, transportation-wise. All of the calculations that the tool makes are ultimately expressed in percentage reduction relative to the unmitigated VMT of a project. So where that would presumably take effect is in the, the the calculation of a project's VMT preceding the step where the tool ends up getting used. Um, that said, it's it's easier said than done to know how to adjust the baseline VMT to reflect new telecommuting patterns. And it's, we we know for certainty that more telecommuting isn't just a straight haircut to VMT because there's a lot you know. Some of that that reduction is recaptured, and right on time, my cat is here. Um, some of that reduction is is captured in new utility trips that were previously passed by trips on on the journey to work and so forth. Um, all that said, the the hope of this tool is to be as applicable as possible to as many project types as possible. So, I, as I say, I think this tool is is the sweet spot of this tool is a land use project um, and a transit project per se, depending on the transit project, may be relatively well captured by certain transit strategies having to do with improving the frequency or improving the coverage area of transit. Um, but especially, I'm yeah, sorry, um, especially new rail expansion projects strike me as, as a little bit outside of the wheelhouse of this tool per se. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, to, your, to your rhetorical question, I, I agree. The hope is that this tool can begin to continue to to knit the land use and transportation planning concerns more closely together. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that does help. It helps me understand the applicability of the tool and then the additional work that would need to be done. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Drew. And thank you, Mr. Fair, for indulging my, my long-winded question. So the director Corsi. Thanks. Uh, and um, thanks, Chris and Drew, for the work on this. Um, it seems you know, we've, we've been waiting to, to get this implemented in, into everything that we do for a long time. And I guess I'm wondering, though, um, does this, how does this become certified or, or um, who gives a blessing to it as far as how it, how it fits into CEQA review? Um, the, how does that work? I can take a attempt unless you want to <laughs> try. No, I was thinking the same thing, Chris. Yeah. Um, you know, what What we've been seeing is these types of tools and other formulas and information um, need to find their way into the local process. So the local, you know, traffic study guidelines, um, the environmental process there. So uh, what we're trying to do is just, this has been a, a big gap um, because, you know, it was pretty easy to know how to mitigate for level of service impacts. You build a new signal, try and address those congestion impacts. And VMT, it's been kind of a ad hoc approach up until now with not a lot of consistency. So, you know, the main goal of this project was to, to add some more science and consistency to that whole process and provide something that would allow different projects to be um, handled similarly across across the board. So um, that being said, the research for BMT reduction is pretty young at this point, and we're expecting a lot of more work to be done going forward in the future. Uh, and as Drew said, um, the tool is um, 
and open and hopefully a living tool. So we'll be able to add new information, new uh, mitigation measures over time in there and feed those over to the to the local jurisdictions as well as well. But to you know answer your original question, it'll need to find its way into the, the local process. Okay. And and Drew was saying earlier, um, I believe that there are other similar tools and maybe some proprietary tools that uh, Fair and Peers has. Um, are, are, is this happening jurisdiction by jurisdiction, or is there some some um, statewide coordination going on with it? So the state is really uh, they've provided tools looking at big transportation projects, BMT impacts for big highway improvements, things like that. Caltrans and the state have taken the lead on those um, types, of, types of projects. But on the land use side, looking at land use impacts, it's been mostly a regional or local effort. So uh, I mentioned the tool that was developed uh, for the San Diego re region. Um, I believe there's also a Sacramento tool that's been developed or under development. Alameda County also developed a tool. Uh, we have the Sonoma tool as well. And there are even some local Im implementations. Uh, the city of San Jose developed their own tool for just the city of San Jose. So this is all very new and <laughs> it's a little chaotic right now, but we're trying to um, work together. One benefit to uh, working with fair and peers and colleagues around the region and state as we were able to build on the work that was done in San Diego already and done in Alameda County. So a lot of the measures that are in our tool up here in Sonoma County are the same as um, the measures in those tools. The math is, is the same and based on the same information, uh, but also adjusted and updated for local conditions here in Sonoma County. So, uh, you know, I think over time there will be more consistency. Um, we're, we're getting closer and closer, but that's kind of where things are at right now. MDC is watching this right now and is leading a, a regional um, SB 743 and VMT implementation roundtable and education series. So that's available to all of your um, staff at the local level, and most of them are participating in that. And so that's been a good a place for information sharing, education, getting materials ready for implementation. So there are activities going on at the region, local and state level. Okay, that's great. And and good for you for not being afraid to be on the, the cutting edge of that knife. And, um, you know, it's, it's good what we're doing here. I also want to say that is an awesome picture that somebody got of the Windsor Smart Roundabout in your presentation. <laughs> yes, I second that. I yeah. assume that's fairly recent. Yeah. Okay. I believe that was on the Town of Windsor um, Facebook feed is where we found that. So where yeah, you, great, great picture. Stole it? Is that where you stole it from? <laughs> All right. Yep. Good work. Thanks a lot. All right, do we have any other questions from the board? All right, let's go to public comment and see if there's any hands. Uh, yes, I see one hand raised right now. Um, it's listed as the springs. Um, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thanks, Drew, members of the board. Tom Conlon here. Sorry about the tab, the label there. Um, great presentation, Chris and Drew. Um, glad to see this tool coming online. And I appreciate that you're following OPR and CAPCOA's guidance in putting this together. Um, but I'm curious that by choosing to rely on VMT per capita as your VMT reduction metric, that is a, an efficiency metric, um, I'm curious that in your professional opinion, isn't it possible that jurisdictions could follow this methodology diligently and faithfully, and yet still have absolute BMT and greenhouse gas emissions continue to grow? So I'd like you to speak to that, that issue, because uh, I think that's valuable to the board to understand that. And then secondly, um, we've seen several county specific plans recently release 
uh, draft EIRs claiming that VMT induced greenhouse gas emissions are a significant are, are going to be significant and avoidable unavoidable from these plans. Now this tool appears to suggest that mitigation is in fact feasible. I guess the most applicable category would be in that um, community scale strategies list. So I'm hoping that um, you could help us understand whether this new tool could have any benefits for the applications of some of the like EIRs that are already on the street or others that might be coming in the future. Thank you for the consideration of my questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next I have in line is Rick Lutman. Rick, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Drew, and thank you, Chair Rogers. Uh, well, I'm very impressed with this presentation. Uh, it sounds like uh, this will be a very valuable tool. And I'm especially impressed that it looks um, pretty far into the future and, and deals with issues like land use and trans-oriented development, which are hard to implement uh, on, on the short term. Uh, I'm not sure though how broadly it can deal with the reduction of VMT when it comes to problems such as connectivity, which is, is as, as you already know, is a big issue here in Sonoma County. Um, we got great transit systems, but do they connect? I wanted to just tell you briefly about an experience I had a couple of months ago, which I think is probably pretty typical. I had to get out to the airport from my home in Roner Park. It takes about 20 minutes in my car. But I decided, well, there's a bus stop, a, min a minute's walk from my house. I'll take the bus. I'll put my money where my, my mouth is, so to speak. Well, I found out that to make a 4.30 flight, I'd have to leave home at noon. Uh, and that's because I had to take three different buses and there were poor connection times and they wandered all over the place in between. So it, it, that didn't work. And so I thought, well, how about smart? I, I could go on smart. It's about a mile to the Ronan Park station. I can handle that. But Smart dumps me off at the airport road and it's, it's too far to walk to the airport from there. So, uh, so taking public transit just didn't work. Um, and, th th and yeah, so this is my experience, but I think that a lot of people uh, face the same dilemma. And until you solve that, you're not gonna be able to persuade people to get out of their cars and take a less um, environmentally abusive form of transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Chair Rogers, I don't see any other members of the public with their hands up. All right, let's go ahead and bring it back. And let's see if we can get an answer to, to Tom's question. I see Chris shaking his head. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd happy to do that. And uh, thanks for that question, Tom. So uh, the first question was about efficiency metrics and whether or not overall VMT could grow, even though the VMT per person is going down. That certainly could be the case, um, you know, especially if there is a very high growth rate. Um, if there are a lot more people driving fewer miles, the overall VMT could uh, go up. So that should be something that's considered. Um, when people are putting together traffic studies and doing um, environmental work. Uh, on the applicability to current projects, you know, I, I certainly think it could be applied. Um, one thing to note is that the majority of the research on BMT reduction is really focused around um, urbanized areas and suburban areas. So once you get out into the more rural areas, uh, the research basis is a little shakier. So, you know, I think a lot of these um, mitigation measures could be applied, um, but just keeping that in mind, right, um, as you're applying them at the rural level. So it may be a little bit, bit harder to back that up with, with the research. So, um, and I would just state that um, this is a tool. So, you know, I think it's useful for addressing these, but it's always important for um, professional judgment to come in as well. Every project, every location is a little bit different, and there may be different circumstances in, in those areas. And, you know, this tool may give you some good information that'll get you um, most of the way there or part of the way there, but, um, you know, that additional um, logic and thought and other information coming in um, will really enhance the, the total analysis package.
I don't see any other questions. Uh, board members, any last comments or questions before we move on? It's just a huge thank you for the presentation. It's it's exciting work, and I know that it is uh, very in depth. And I know that we'll be talking about it a lot more as we move forward. And for this was a informational item, so it doesn't require any action. We'll move on to our next uh, next item, item four point three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, BC CAPS is here to give a presentation on our recently completed 2020 greenhouse gas inventory. As you know, we do a greenhouse gas inventory every two years, and uh, we're excited to have this one to present today. It was pretty interesting data that BC will walk you through. Very good. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I'm going to go to share my screen, and then if Drew can help me get confirm. I'm on the right. Hey, how's that look from your end? Um, go under display settings and swap screen. How are we looking now? Did I get we it? We're looking good, BC. We're ready Very to go. Good. Hey, well, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rogers and other members of the board. Uh, as Suzanne said, my name is BC Caps. I'm the climate change program specialist here at RCPA. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today presenting on the results of our most recent uh, countywide inventory of greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the year 2020. Um, first, I'll provide a historical overview of some of our past inventory efforts. Uh, second, I want to walk through the results of the most recent inventory and highlight each of the five main emission sectors that we track. And finally, I want to conclude by looking at how the emissions break down across jurisdictions and see how we can best compare those results across cities um, to uh, guide our future actions here at RCPA. So to start, uh, we need to return briefly to 2016 when RCPA undertook the Climate Action 2020 initiative and created our first greenhouse gas inventory uh, using uh, 2010 data. So this, data, this effort also resulted in a, uh, the creation of a historical backcast uh, using 1990 data, which uh, we use to provide a benchmark and track our progress on all of our local climate protection efforts. Um, as part of the Climate Action 2020 um, project, an ambitious set, uh, ambitious set of goals uh, was adopted by the RCPA board. Uh, those are listed at the top of this slide. Um, and those include uh, the target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 25 percent below 1990 levels by the year 2020. So following this initial inventory in 2016, updates have been completed in 2018 using 2015 data and in 2020 using 2018 data, and now here in 2022 using 2020 data. Uh, all these inventories follow the US Community Protocol for Accounting and Reporting of Greenhouse Gas Emissions um, that is prepared by the organization ICLEI, and that protocol was last updated in July of 2019. Uh, finally, as part of our Sonoma Climate Mobilization Strategy, which, is, which was adopted by this board uh, in March 2021, uh, there were additional greenhouse gas goals that were um, adopted that are even further strengthened. And these updated goals, which are listed on the bottom of the slide, uh, call for a even deeper emissions reductions of up to 80% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. Uh, so we are looking to work with our agency partners to also um, increase sequ carbon sequestration efforts to balance that last 20% of emissions uh, to hopefully uh, re um, attain carbon neutral neutrality by the year 2030. So that's the goal that we're currently working at. So now to look at some of the actual results from this year's inventory. Um, here you can see that the countywide emissions for 2020 were just over 3 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, you'll see here that the building emission, building energy emissions are just at just over two thirds of a million metric tons or 23% of our total emissions. The second large bar in orange are our transportation emissions. Those are at about 1.7 million tons and account for 58% of the overall total. Water, solid waste, and agriculture show that much smaller emission totals and lower percentages of the whole. 
Um, and as with past inventories, it can be seen that major opportunities still exist in lowering the emissions from both the building and transportation sector. Um, so we'll be looking now, um, and we're also looking at solid waste in the agricultural sectors for additional opportunities to make that very deep 80% reduction goal. Um, this chart here shows the progression of our emissions uh, inventory from 1990 through to 20, 2020, a uh, time span of approximately of 30 years. So um, beginning at 3.94 million metric tons in, 20, in 1990 uh, to our total of just over 3 million metric tons today. So this is a 23% reduction goal from our 1990 levels and it falls just short of our Climate Action 2020 goal that we've been aiming for. So all this, although this indicates we didn't fully meet our ambitious target, it's still an incredible accomplishment. And um, I just, it, for me, it really shows the dedicated effort of our CPA staff, our jurisdictional members, and our agency partners, and the numerous other organizations around Sonoma County who are working on climate issues. Um, so for these continuing efforts, I just want to offer a, a, a wholehearted um, thank you to all the effort that's gone in to get to this 23% reduction over the last uh, number of years. Um, this topic, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the impacts of COVID-19. This came up in the last presentation on the MT reductions, and I think it's really important to mention here. Again, um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, especially at the very start, uh, VMT numbers, transportation and VMT were dramatically reduced. Um, and this can be seen in our GHG numbers um, with showing some of the impacts, um, kind of some of the lower emissions uh, through the year 2020. Um, although the short-term impacts um, are very evident, we're still unsure about the full impact of the long-term implications and how um, it has changed our travel modes um, and how that's gonna play out over time. Um, so we expect that actually as VMT continues to increase, we're hoping that the GHG emissions of, um, attributed to that will not as increase as fast, really looking at the fuel efficiency standards of, uh, of a higher fuel, fuel efficiency standards of vehicles, and especially now with the oncoming um, requirement at the state level for 100% zero emission vehicle sales by the year 2035. So those are all going to be steps in the right direction to help us keep these reductions down that really were attributed to COVID. Um, I'm going to jump now into each of the five sectors that we track. Um, so first off, looking at the emissions that come due to building energy. So this is really uh, energy that's used to heat, cool um, our buildings, energy that's used for all of our lights, um, all of our cooking. Uh, so you can see that in this, um, in this um, sector, we've had a 20%, 23%, oh, it's 23% of our total emissions inventory. And we've had a 49% reduction from the 2029 uh, or from the 1990 baseline. Um, so that is really, I think a huge portion of that is that's really attributable to Sonoma Clean Power, the formation of Sonoma Clean Power in 2014. And, um, and their dramatic reduction in, or their, um, uh, their push to really move towards um, whole, um, towards uh, increasing the, um, the investments they've made in 100% renewable power, and that has helped bring down the emissions total. Um, looking at this really quick, you can see that that natural gas bar is still very high now relative to the electricity. And I think that there's an opportunity there that we'll have a dedicated effort to look at the um, installation, the conversion of away from natural gas appliances towards things like electric heat pumps and electric induction uh, cooking technologies that will continue to put, ratchet these uh, emissions down over time. Moving on to transportation, um, as probably everyone on this call knows, uh, this is probably uh, the, the most, one of the most difficult um, uh, areas for us to tackle and one of the areas where we're putting the most, uh, the most effort, both um, here at RCPA and in, co in connection with our, our colleagues at uh, SCTA. Um, 
So briefly, I think that I mentioned the reductions we've seen over in 2020 from the uh, that are potentially due to COVID. And now we're looking at how um, we can keep those changes, um, kind of keep those um, emissions totals down over the long term. Um, there's two major areas that we're focusing on here. And these really come back to a lot of the work that was done a few years ago around our shift Sonoma County plan. Uh, we're looking to continue to implement our fuel shift strategies. And that's really looking at increasing the number of electric vehicles that are owned and used by local residents and businesses, um, as well as we um, really additionally need to give, um, need to and continue to give additional focus on kind of our mode shift strategies to get people not just driving electric vehicles, we get them choosing different modes. Hey, maybe this is a trip that I can use, I can do on the bus, or maybe this is a walking trip. Hey, I'll take my bike today um, and turn it into a recreational trip. So I think those continue to be um, opportunity areas for us in the future. Um, we have seen a 16% reduction in the last couple of years, and it, but it's still the emissions from transportation make up nearly 60% of our total. Uh, Water-related emissions, uh, a much smaller portion of the pie, only 1% of our overall total. Um, but you can see the key thing here I wanted to point out was um, a 68% reduction from the 1990 baseline. And um, really to highlight the work of our partners, this is really um, directly attributable to the work on, um, from Sonoma Water and their um, carbon-free water campaign. Uh, which they began in 2015, which was really a, a large scale investment to procure 100% of their electricity from uh, renewable and carbon free resources. And so we can see uh, the impacts of that um, with basically the, the electricity use emissions from the electricity used to pump all of our water um, around the county. Um, moving on briefly to solid waste. Um, emissions um, from solid waste, again, it's a small part of the pie, only about 6% 6, 6 of our total. But again, I wanted to point out that the, this 50% reduction in emissions from our 1990 baseline. Um, again, these numbers, there are incredible numbers to kind of think about in real terms. And this is really due to uh, um, some new requirements that have been passed at the state level um, to really increase the collection of organic waste and to increase dramatically increase um, composting um, uh, opportunities, um, as well as it's really um, a lot of effort that's been done at the county level from our waste management authority, um, Zero Waste Sonoma, and the work that they're doing um, directly in, uh, in conjunction with all the jurisdictions, really, again, to try to um, uh, get these waste reduction numbers down and then to uh, reuse what waste is collected to try to reuse and divert that in some ways. Uh, the last of our five major emission sectors is agriculture. Uh, it does make up 13% of our total. Uh, we've seen very little change over the course of the inventory in agriculture. Um, you can see that the majority of the emissions in this sector are from the NOR management. Um, I think that shows uh, another opportunity area and potential partnerships for us to think about in the future with uh, with uh, a, a ways to look at that. Um, it's not currently a focus or specialty of our CPA and our staff here, but I think it shows that there's opportunities even here within agriculture. Oh, I'd like to move briefly now here, I'll kind of wrapping up, we're moving through the final bit. I wanted to talk about how these emissions are distributed among our various jurisdictions. All those previous slides were really looking at the county level at the combined totals for the entire county. Um, and so this slide here is really, these are population totals for the each of the jurisdictions. So these are not the emissions, but I just wanted to show that um, I think this is a, uh, I think everybody here is probably aware, you know, Santa Rosa is the largest city in the county, has the highest proportion of, um, has the highest proportion of um, residents. And um, I'm gonna flip now from population to look at the GHG totals for each of the jurisdictions. And here you can see that it follows a very, very similar pattern. Um, as expected, the two slides are nearly identical. I'm actually gonna flip back and forth this slightly. Here we have population, here we have emissions. So you can kind of see population 
it really does follow. The more people in an area, the more emissions you're going to have. Um, but then when we combine these two, and I found this personally very interesting, I think there's a lot of room for additional analysis that we can do here. When we combine these two and look at emissions per capita or emissions per person, we get a completely different picture. And I'm not, um, the, the intention of this slide is not to say put any jurisdiction, any individual jurisdiction on the spot and say, hey, why are you higher or lower than the others? Um, but it was incredibly, um, it was very illustrative to me to really to kind of see both that our averages across the county, the highest average we have in any jurisdiction is at 7.4 um, uh, metric tons per person. That is well below the state average and more than half or approximately half of the national average. Um, and I do think that this is an area by looking, I'm interested personally in looking deeper into these stats and kind of trying to understand then why some of the jurisdictions may be higher or lower. And I think as we dig in and look at this per capita stat on each of the emissions, each of the subsections, the sectors, we'll actually be able to really kind of identify jurisdiction specific um, areas where we can look for it, continue to look for improvement. Um, so let's see, to wrap up um, in kind of conclusion, I wanted to just reiterate some of our common, our, our, um, uh, our key findings from this inventory. Um, overall, our GHG emissions had decreased 22.9% from 1990. Our building energy emissions have decreased 49%. Solid waste emissions down 50%. Um, transportation continues to be the largest source of emissions, covering nearly 60% of the um, county total. Um, as I mentioned, the short-term impacts of COVID are, are evident, but we're not sure of the long-term implications. Um, and even though we were very close to meeting our 2020 goal, um, we're going to continue to need dramatic in decreases in emissions and large-scale increases in carbon sequestration. And we're going to need both of those things to uh, meet our 2020 carbon neutrality goal. So um, we've made great, we've made great, made great progress so far, um, but our work is far from complete. So um, we've still got a long way to go. So um, with that, that concludes my presentation, and I wanted to thank you and um, hand it back over to the board. Thanks. Thanks, BC. I'm looking to see. Let's start with Director Fisher. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you've, uh, MC, if you've done any analysis based on this data of what percentage of mode shift we need countywide in order to meet our 2030 goals. I do not have those stats at my fingertips. And so, one of, oh, I'll, I'll point out one of the things, even though I alluded in this presentation a number of times to the things that we need to do, the intent of this specific exercise was to take a snapshot to point us in that direction. So we do in-house, we do have information that I can follow up with you on. I don't have it personally at my fingertips right now. So. Great, I appreciate that, thank you. Go to Director Bagby. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ter Chair. Yeah, thank you, BC, for anticipating one of my um, big questions was where's the graphic that combines uh, GHG emissions and uh, per capita um, on the pivot table. So thank you. Um, but I, I also, as, as much as we all want to improve, I think when just kind of on the first page of the staff report, I was really struck by the progress that we have made. And I think that that's the message that um, maybe doesn't get out to, um, to our constituents. I, I'm not even sure it gets out to our other, you know, council members and staff is the, the progress that we have made. And I, I think it really, um, I, I just want to let you know, I so appreciate the in the, the deep dive and the full report and the pure wonkiness of the whole thing. Um, but I also could, could just um, see there's a desperate need for an infographic just to, to show people um, the, the sectors that we've had really great improvement on and then some of the tougher sectors and maybe you know talk a little bit about what it's really going to take to to move the needle on our, our tougher sector. So um, thanks so much for, for a great report. Um, 
And I also like that you, you're, you kind of even went as far as hinting at, you know, identifying the strategies that we can take moving forward to um, move the needle on on some of those those tougher areas. So yeah, thanks so much for for a great report. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Director Gurney. Say, I want to uh, go along with those appreciations, BC, from Cloverdale. I agree with all of them. I especially did appreciate that uh, by jurisdiction per capita use. So my question for you is to confirm, if you can, that your Sebastopol numbers were actually related to our city limits and not the zip code. That's often confused and we get a lot of statistics, you know, from tourism, wherever, go by zip code. I have a, I will double check that and we will, I will get back to you directly to confirm that. Okay, yeah, we can do that offline. Yeah. Thank you. I just, yeah, I'm hoping you're going to say, yeah, it's the city limits. It should have been. It should I have hope been. so. But um, we've put the data for this inventory comes from a number of different sources. Each of those sources, uh, we try to pull as consistent as we can. Some of them may be tagged to zip codes, and I'll just I'll want to run through and double check that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Not urgent, but I'd just like your sure. update on it. Thank you. Of course. Vice Chair. Thanks. And um, similar questions, actually. I was really um, curious to find out a little bit more down the path that Director Gurney was going down. I don't want to shame any jurisdictions, but I want to know, like, what is it behind those numbers, right? You know, is it specifically commute? Is it energy consumption? You know, are we looking at sort of natural gas and propane, you know, utilization, for instance, in unincorporated areas? So, um, you know, I just would love to, to dive into the nitty gritty details. And I know that data is data, but the analysis is so critical. And I look forward to, I guess, taking that next step of, you know, where, where are we seeing better practices and worse practices? And again, not having like some race or competition or saying, you know, we're better than you, but like, how do we mobilize those great things and then address the challenges in certain communities? Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with some of my rural colleagues on, or far, I guess, further from the center of the county, I won't call you necessarily rural, but, um, you know, about transportation, transit, and how do we sort of increase accessibility um, outside of, say, the smart train spine to some of those areas that are either west or east or north of that core. So anyways, I just really look forward to the next steps. And um, this was great information, but it just leaves me full of more questions, honestly. Um, Dr. Bagby? Oh, sorry, okay. go ahead, BC. Chair, yeah, just, just a quick follow-up. And wait, wait, wait. Mel, Mel, hold on one second. Go ahead, BC. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to point out, I don't know if I mentioned it in the presentation. Our full report has a full page for each jurisdiction, which gives much more a detailed breakdown jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And that's in the report in the board packet. Um, and then I'll be doing some additional analysis over the upcoming weeks to really pull those apart even further and then be able to, to meet uh, with other jurisdictions. So great, thank you. All right, go ahead, Director Bagby. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, and actually just on the heels of that, I had a follow-up question, BC, um, and you allude to it in um, the packet, the fact that um, you know some of us run our own water systems and some of us are uh, part of Sonoma Water. So, I mean, and not to put you on the spot today, but some of the granul gran granularity I'd be interested in seeing possibly in the future is uh, a breakout of um, folks who are on Sonoma Water and folks who are on there their own water systems. And looking at, you know, how does that impact the per capita um, um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions numbers? So you know, not, um, if it, it's not possible this time, great, but perhaps going forward. No, I think it's very possible by asking, formulating the questions we wanna answer, and then I can work to pull that out of the data set, absolutely. Right, and thank you so much, BC. You know, I'm going to uh, state the obvious. I, I really appreciate the, the jurisdictional comparison. Uh, and from my perspective, Santa Rosa, Petaluma, and Runner Park, being the denser cities, should have the, the lower energy consumption per capita. Um, and so we got to get those numbers certainly lower uh, in Santa Rosa and keep working on that. Uh, but I appreciate you setting the, the benchmark for us. I was also curious to see if it'd be possible for us to look at this data based on income, um, energy consumption based on income levels in certain areas of the, the county. Um, I suspect that it might correlate uh, roughly with, with that as we've seen kind of across the, the state. 
Uh, to respond very quickly, um, that data is available. It's not in the data that I used for this report, but that data is available and we can easily um, work with you to assemble a report. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's go to the vice chair and then Director Kelly. Thanks so much. Yeah, I just had a follow-up question because I saw sort of the page by page analysis, but is there kind of the data that feeds into that? So like when we're looking at sort of building emissions, right? Like what specifically, you know, is it is it electricity use? Is it sort of propane or, or natural gas, um, you know, kind of percent of Sonoma clean power? And then for specifically for transportation, like do we have by district kind of the percent of trips that are by transit, you know, sort of walking, cycling, um, sort of single occupancy vehicle, vehicle and like the average lengths of trips and things like that, that we could compare and contrast. I feel like we're, we're talking kind of about cross tabs. Is that correct? Like kind of a, to use a polling metaphor. Um, is, is that how BC, is that something? I think we have, what I, what I will certainly offer to do over the upcoming week is to start to pull together those, those follow-up questions and then to identify what data I have in this inventory data set that's useful, where we need to pull data from other sources. Uh, as I mentioned, the income data is not currently in here. Um, and then yes, we do have all of those details. Um, it gets messy behind the scenes, and so I haven't shared those publicly. But we do have that, and can pull out. I think what we what what um, I'm hearing the questions asked for. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Director Kelly. Thank you, Chair Rogers, and thank you, BC, for the presentation and this data. It's it's very illuminating. Um, of course, we don't want to be at the top of that uh, emissions per capitalist in Healdsburg, but um, I do think one of the, the questions I had that, that came from that, and apologies if this is a repeat from, from another director, but um, in looking at emissions based on buildings, uh, the difference between single family home and multifamily homes, and to see if we can get, we, we just recently um, had an item before us in Healdsburg, uh, unfortunately not uh, in not passing a reach code um, to the extent that I wanted it to with too many exceptions still on the table. But um, one of the things we talked about was the difference in emissions uh, per multifamily versus single family and Healdsburg being a historically pretty redlined city with the majority single family homes, uh, not a lot of multifamily homes. I think we could definitely, that type of data would be very helpful for us in looking at how we look at housing development in the future um, and how we talk to our residents about housing development in our communities and what kind of development is not as resource intensive, both from, as we talk about water resource availability, but, but here and also talking about emissions. So that would be helpful if we could look at that uh, as well. Thanks. And then BC, I've got one last question for you before we go to public comment and it's blind speculation on your, your part or at least some speculation based on uh, available uh, trend lines. Uh, it looks like with transportation being down only about 1% uh, from, uh, from the last update, is it fair to say that if not for COVID, likely our transportation numbers would be higher than they had been in the last inventory? Uh, I believe that the inventory actually shows a de speaker decline in transportation over the last two years, and that it's a 1% change since 1990. Yeah, I apologize. The 1% since 1990 uh, with that deeper change due to COVID. Um, I think for this, this gets into a level of detail where I um, should rely on, say, um, uh, my should rely on Chris Barney and should rely on others to actually kind of think this through a little bit more. So. I appreciate that. Uh, Director Fisher, you had something else? Yeah, I had a follow up question. Um, so we're looking at 2020 data now and um, um, I'm looking to the future and when, when will we have 2021 data analysis available? Is, um, it, is it like a year from now or can it happen sooner than that? Um, our CPA standard has been to perform this inventory approximately every two to three years. Mm. So we do not we ha do not have our next inventory officially scheduled. But the, my working assumption is that we would be looking we would be working in 2023 to analyze 2022 data. That is purely my own speculation at this point. But following our pattern, that is what uh, would be our next expectation. 
That does not mean that we can't do this every year, but I think we would need to think about internal resources and kind of what uh, what's the value, um, kind of the value proposition of having uh, regularly updated annual numbers versus more of that snapshot approach. Well, I, I I think because we only have eight years, um, it will keep us keep us on track and keep us with a rhythm and you know keep us competing against one another to get those numbers down. <laughs> uh, I'll also jump in and really, depending upon the sector that we're analyzing, that analysis might actually be very simple to do on an annual basis. Um, I haven't thought through, but a lot of these now, um, a lot of these may actually be. It was a heavy lift over the last couple of months to kind of. Start this up after a couple of year breaks, but actually now that we've got the wheel rolling, maybe there is a methodology here we can put in place where it's a little bit more of a continuous collection of data, um, even if it's not a full report. Uh, right. Maybe it's more of just a continuous, uh, more of a continuous data set. Yeah, and maybe it's not the granular data, but it's just like, okay, here are our four sectors. How are we doing in those four sectors? And particularly transportation and housing, and maybe we just focus on those two for the moment. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, directors, let's go ahead and go to public comment. Got a couple of hands here. All righty, so um, we will start with Jake McKenzie. Jake, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you- Jake, Jake McKenzie, never heard of him before. Who's this guy? Well, you're about to hear from me again. So there, anyway, um, good to be uh, back in touch with y'all, uh, Jake McKenzie. Uh, representing the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. Uh, I'm replacing the late uh, uh, Willard Richards as their representative on the Citizens Advisory Committee, and I'm looking forward to that uh, assignment. Uh, yeah, transportation and housing. Uh, the, the question that I have has been referred to by your chair, um, housing unit density per acre, and then I also thought an, a, another data point to look at uh, single family housing units and multiple family housing units. And it was fascinating to hear you discuss the VMT methodology earlier on in your meetings. So uh, my, I just, it's just a question to throw out. Uh, do you have the ability uh, to look at the uh, emissions data per community and also do a comparison on housing density and also uh, multiple family versus uh, single family, which uh, would seem to me the way to be driving the land use planning uh, uh, equation, given that housing elements are on all of your collective minds. So thank you for the chance and good to be back in touch with you all. Right, thank you, Jay. Uh, next I have in line is Tom Conlon. Tom, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thanks, Drew. Uh, BC, wonderful work. Congratulations on getting us to this stage. It's, it's really valuable to have now so many years of trend data uh, on what's remained a fairly uh, consistent methodology. So some, some things really jump out uh, on what we're making good progress on and where we're not making progress. Um, I really wanna uh, support some of the comments of the, <clears throat> of the board. Um, I'd, like, I'd love to see the correlation as, as, uh, Chair, Rogers, uh, as Chair Rogers mentioned about income um, on those jurisdictional breakouts. Um, Director Bagby also mentioned a drill down into the em emissions intensity of our water sources. I think that would be fascinating to look at. As I understand it right now, private well users are, in, are aggregated in with the building sector emissions. And so while I wouldn't advocate removing them, I do think a side study on that would be very helpful for the uh, groundwater sustainability agencies and others moving forward. And it shouldn't be too hard to do a back of the envelope approximation there. Um, I had some questions. I, I, I hope you can answer. I think that the transportation category still excludes the sale of aircraft fuel at the airport. 
And as we know, airport takeoffs and landings, maybe for the 2020 period are down. They are definitely down for that year. Um, but that'll be something that exists off book as it were in this. And I had understood that ICLE was now recommending that um, jurisdictions with significant tourism activity should, uh, and airports should consider including that into such an inventory such as this one. So I just double check on that best practice. Um, as far as uh, the similarly under transportation, smart now shows up as a very small absolute value, but it might be interesting to do a per capita breakout on the ridership of smart versus the people traveling, all the people traveling by uh, methods on road. I don't know if there's a way to come up with a per, a per capita efficiency metric to compare those two modes. Um, it might be, I'm curious what that might say. And then finally on the uh, Healdsburg, uh, I've been following those per capita differences for a number of years. And it is remarkable to see how Healdsburg has increased in its intensity um, over the last few years. So glad that that's on the table now. Thank you for your all your work. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next I have in line is Pete Gang. Pete, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you, Drew. And uh, just a, a couple of quick comments. Uh, thank you, BC. Wonderful analysis. I agree with Director Kelly that uh, this information is very illuminating. And it is just a sharp contrast between good news, bad news. Um, one, one observation, I just wanted to underscore that Transportation is our largest single source of activity-based or sector-based emissions, and we're really not moving the needle. Um, so everything that we can do, we must do, if we're taking our 2030 carbon neutrality target seriously. Um, within the realm of building emissions, I suspect, this is, a, I guess, a question, I suspect that the emissions attributed to, uh, to methane, to um, natural gas, do only account for the CO2 emissions when, the, when natural gas is burned, rather than taking into account methane as a, a virulent greenhouse gas in itself. And the last comment, I just wanted us all to acknowledge that these analyses only look at our sector-based emissions. They ignore our consumption-based emissions because they are with, beyond the purview of ICLE, but they still exist. The atmosphere doesn't really care whether ICLE takes consumption-based emissions into account or not. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Chair Rogers, I don't see any other members of the public who wish to speak. I'll go ahead and bring it back. Let's go to Director Landman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just begin by saying no better time to present BC, Mr. Caps, than when you have good news to share. And this is, at least in my perspective, good news. I remember being roughly a decade ago, being rather new on this committee and reporting back a council meeting on our staffs at that time and meeting our goals. Uh, and they were nowhere near as close as they were now. And I remember uh, someone perhaps less supportive of environmental goals in the audience snickering loudly, essentially saying we'd never get there. And you know what? I'm gonna happily round 22.9 up to 23. And as a matter of fact, what the heck, I'm taking license and rounding it all the way up to 25 and calling this a good win. Uh, but I will point out that that win is probably largely because of one kind of outside event that happened. And that was the inauguration of Sonoma Clean Power and the rapid pull in of almost the whole population uh, into a much cleaner power package. Uh, Sonoma Clean Power, we have that uh, is Clean Start is our regular power package. It's about 49% renewable. We're looking at about a 49% reduction in energy used in buildings. 
Uh, so this is a good thing. But as we look to how can we move forward in the future, how we can do better, there's actually another low hanging fruit sitting right in front of us that I think the public just, and maybe some of us aren't even as aware of it as we could be. And that's Evergreen. That's the 100% renewable package that Sonoma Clean Power offers, uh, local renewable. And most importantly, it's balanced. And what I mean by that, it is a mix of solar and geothermal, which means that when the sun goes down, there's no need for us to lean on peaking gas power plants to cover any shortages in power. This truly is renewable 24 seven. So if we were to do that, we would essentially be once again, doing that same level of reduction in all those factors. So I, I suggest this only just to encourage, many cities have already joined for their municipal accounts. I'd like to encourage in kind of a friendly challenge everybody else in the other communities um, to join Evergreen, uh, to bring in your municipal accounts, to encourage your friends, your neighbors, the public to join, simply because if we want to look at how we might meet our 2030 goals, if you picture adopting a power source like Evergreen on a large scale, which we could do in this county, combined with work and fuel switch to EVs, all of a sudden we have something big. We have a huge reduction in the largest remaining emission sector, which is transportation. So that was kind of, I guess, a friendly challenge, an advertisement, and a, and a thumbs up for a job well done to staff. But I enjoyed this report very much. And I would ask everybody to think hard about that because the more we, more we can encourage and leverage up Evergreen, it will really help us with all of our goals in a large way. So thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. No, thank you, Director Landon. Let's go to the Vice Chair. Thanks. I was just wondering if we have a greenhouse gas inventory for the carbon emissions associated with the wildfires that we've experienced. I do not believe that that has been incorporated into past um, inventories, with the exception that in the, uh, especially in the 2018, or the, the debris that was caused from the past wildfires and needed to go to the landfill was identified, and there were special um, uh, special calculations done to quantify the emissions from those. Um, additional, the, the solid waste component, um, but not from the actual burning of vegetation. Yeah, I think that quantification, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say there's kind of two aspects to that. Well, maybe three given the debris landfilling issue, which was really negligible because all the carbon had been released from that debris for the most part. Um, but there's the loss of tree canopy and sequestration opportunity. And then there's also the actual emission from you know, whatever is burning. Um, but it's challenging to calculate because it's done more based on statewide. It, it, like the last time we looked into it, it was very statewide oriented um, and harder to parse for local, uh, local fires. But and loss I, of loss of acreage and acreage type, there might be some way to do that, but I, we have not. I wonder if that's something that could be pulled into the sort of carbon sequestration opportunity, um, you know, study that we're looking at with Ag and Open Space, that there's mm -hmm. also sort of an assessment included of what's been lost and what's threatened to be lost. I mean, um, I was just hearing from regional parks that 11 redwood trees uh, were cut down, you know, in the past week at Riverside Riverfront Park because they were drought stressed and dead. Um, you know, imposed a, a risk to visitors. So we're also sort of losing habitat and carbon sequestration capability um, due to the drought. So um, anyway, it's just kind of food for thought because we sort of looked at, I felt like the built environment, but we're also unfortunately losing our carbon sequestration capacity at the same time, we're also emitting um, carbon from burning. So anyways. All right, I don't see any other hands. So Suzanne, uh, do we need a motion to adopt the report? Yes, please. So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second. Oh. And I think that was Director Fisher. It was. All right, let's call the vote. Right. Director Bagby. Aye. Director Corsi. Yes. Director Elward. Yes. Director Fisher. Yes. Director Gurney. 
Aye. Director Kelly? Aye. Director Landman? Aye. Director Lowe? Direct Director Rabbit? Aye. Director Reynosa? Aye. Vice Chair Hopkins? Yes. And Chair Rogers? Aye. And that passes. Great. Thank you so much, BC. We all obviously really love the uh, report. Thank you for all your work on it. And we'll be talking soon on more of it. Very good. Thank you all. All right, Suzanne, let's go to item 4.4. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ross Clendenin is here. We were going to just do a brief update on the funding for climate ad hoc. The last meeting was in June, um, but there's been some activity since then that we wanted to update the full board on. So Ross, do you want to take it away? Absolutely. I will make this brief. Apologies. All right, Drew, do I need to switch or are we looking okay? Switch. You'll need to switch. All right, there we go. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, I'd like to provide a brief update on the funding for climate change ad hoc July 14th meeting and related activities. We're very happy to report that Senate Bill 852 was signed by the governor last week. This legislation designates RCPA as a pre-established climate resilience entity and will allow climate action funding from previously unavailable sources. It also gives RCPA another first, the first climate resilience district in California. Progress continues on the SGC RCC grant, another potential source of funds for the Sonoma climate mobilization efforts. The current plan is to collaborate with Daily Acts to submit a full grant proposal. A draft charter detailing the new structure uh, was presented during the July meeting. This charter detailed the role, structure, and membership guidelines moving forward towards a potential climate measure. The new, new structure involves uh, local climate leaders in four different sectors, transportation, buildings, land, and water, and environmental justice, led by a steering committee that also works with local government and tribal partners. Climate leaders for each sector were discussed. Potential committee leaders have been contacted by RCPA staff and most positions with the exception of environmental justice have been filled. A brain trust meeting with local community-based organization leaders was held on August 31st. that yielded useful feedback on filling this uh, environmental justice committee role. RCPA presented customized funding for climate change slide decks at the city of Petaluma Climate Action Commission, city of Sebastopol Climate Action Committee and Rotor Park City Council. These presentations focused on the climate crisis facing Sonoma County and RCPA's role in implementing climate solutions. The updated funding for climate change structure and schedule were also presented. Attendees were asked to complete a survey defining their vision for a healthy climate resilient Sonoma County. RCPA staff and Sound Ideas Media filmed several brief interviews for an RCPA funding for climate change video on August 19th and 31st in Santa Rosa and Healdsburg. The content focused on the goals of the funding for climate change efforts. This footage will be combined with existing footage of Sonoma County and local climate impacts. The end goal is to create a tool that will help promote Sonoma climate mobilization goals during meetings and on social media channels. Our CPA's funding for climate change survey in English and Spanish will also be promoted at upcoming events, uh, such as Los Cien's State of the Latino Community Address. RCPA is continuing to seek opportunities to present to community groups in all Sonoma County jurisdictions. As for next steps, uh, steering, committee, steering committee kickoff meeting will be held later this month. Uh, new funding opportunities now available due to recent legislation will be explored uh, and the SGC RCC grant process uh, will continue. 
please let me know if you have any questions regarding this funding for climate change ad hoc committee update. I thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much, Ross. Let's see if there's any questions from the board. Seeing none, let's go to public comment on this item. Um, confirming, I do not see any members of the public who wish to speak on this item. All right, then I'll just bring it back and I'll see if anybody wants to make a motion approving the resolution of support for the, the Strategic Growth Council grant. So moved. I will second that. The vice chair is on it with uh, Director Elward with the second. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Uh, Director Bagby. Uh, aye. Director Corsi. Yes. Director Elward. Yes. Director Fisher. Yes. Director Gurney. Aye. Director Kelly. Aye. Director Landman. Aye. Director Lowe. Director Rabbit. Aye. Director Reynosa. Aye. Vice Chair Hopkins. Yes. And Chair Robert uh, Rogers. Excuse me. Aye. <laughs> and that, that motion passes. <laughs> All right, we've got a couple of report items left uh, for the board. Let's go to item 4.5. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dana Ture is here to uh, give an update on bike share and active transportation uh, items. So I will hand it off to her. Thank you, Suzanne. And hello, directors. I'm going to share a, a presentation. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Great. Um, I also have uh, Laura Kroll from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission um, on today, who will be uh, presenting as well on the um, some bike share programs in the Greater Bay Area. So the item today is an update on the status of the Sonoma Marin bike share pilot program uh, that we are now at a turning point with because the vendor that we have been working with to develop the program over the last couple of years has gone out of business. As a background, um, the SETA partnered with the Transportation Authority of Marin on a grant application for bike share implementation funding through MTC. And the two entities have had joint oversight over the program and SETA took the role as the funding and contract administrator. We established a contract with Bolt Mobility for a system of 300 bicycles in seven cities along the SMART corridor. Uh, the idea was to serve smart stations, transit hubs, and key destinations, including downtowns, colleges, and universities along the corridor. We established a coordination agreement with all local jurisdiction and transit districts involved, as well as with the bike share operator, SCTA, and TAM. Our joint agency grant awarded by MTC is for $826,000 with in-kind match from SCTA, SCTA and TAM. Uh, these grant funds have not yet been spent. The contractor, Bolt Mobility, had agreed to a three-year pilot program with deployment of 300 or more electric pedal assist bicycles. They were to hire local staff, secure warehouse funding or facilities, utilize their call center, um, plan for the service area and parking hub locations, do outreach and communications, carry out a safety program and provide and maintain the hardware and software as well as rebalance the system and establish pricing and membership options, including an equity program. So a summary of the program activities that we completed. In February 2020, this board approved a contract with Bolt Mobility, which is was formerly Gotcha Mobility. And since then, we worked with the operator and participating agencies to develop a coordination agreement, establishing roles and responsibilities with all the participating agencies to uh, develop a coordination agreement, um, a, as well as establish user pricing and memberships, facilitate initial sponsorship commitments, we supported Bolt in planning for each parking hub site and submitting a number of site permit requests to local jurisdictions. We reviewed draft, a draft marketing plan as well as draft marketing materials. And in early 2021, the contract was 
reassigned from Gotcha to Bolt, Bolt Mobility, who is taking over operations for the company. We did experience some pandemic and staff turnover related delays. And we were in the final stretch of site permitting when Bolt's team had stopped responding to our emails in June. Um, at that time, SCTA notified the working group of challenges and we began legal review of options to terminate the contract. By July, we started seeing news reports about the company shutting down. And in August, Bolt finally issued a statement on their website about seizing operations. SCTA issued a notice to terminate the contract with Bolt on August 19th. And our agreement has a 60 day cure period. So we anticipate the contract being officially terminated in mid-October. Since all of this started, SETA and TAM have been in discussion with MTC about options for the program and use of grant funding moving forward. We've also been talking with the city of Richmond who had an active Bolt bike share system through the same grant program. We have heard from some vendors about their interest in operating in the area. And we've been doing research on the industry, which has shown somewhat of an uncertain picture of shared micromobility due to a number of factors, including a slow return to work, um, office work, struggling technology market in general, and the overall high cost of operating bike share in less dense cities. So the, some of the things we're considering um, for next steps include whether another operator is willing and able to take on the same scope of work that we had planned, um, or whether a revised scope of work would be more feasible uh, with more flexibility in terms of the type of micromobility vehicles, considering flexibility in a mix of pedal bikes, electric bikes, or scooters, uh, flexibility in the number of micromobility vehicles, geographic areas that it would serve, um, and the length of the pilot program. We're also considering whether we should wait until there are signs of market stability or whether we should consider an alternative program that still advances the goals that we established for the bike share program. So now I'd like to turn it over to Laura Kroll, um, who will talk about some of the regional bike share programs. Thank you, Dana. Um, I'm Laura Kroll. I'm a program coordinator for Bike Share at MTC. And as Dana mentioned, I wanted to provide some additional context of the other bike share programs that MTC is involved with to better understand the industry and what we're seeing in the region. MTC supports two programs, the Bay Wheels system as a contract administrator and the Bike Share Capital Grant program as grant administrator. The Bike Share Capital Grant program, which is um, which this program is a part of, supports grants to more suburban communities to pilot what bike share can look like outside of denser urban areas. Uh, the Richmond system, if you can just, yeah, thanks Dana. Um, it, the Richmond system, which as Dana mentioned, um, had the same operator, launched for about a year before Bolt abruptly ceased operations. Much like in other systems in the Bay Area, theft and vandalism were a big issue for the operator. Hopper um, operates in Fremont, uh, but they removed their fleet recently due to high theft and vandalism issues. Um, they do remain in good standing with the city and are looking to relaunch soon. And finally, um, we managed the contract for the Bay Wheel system, which is operated by Lyft uh, and is in San Francisco, San Jose, and three East Bay cities, Oakland, Berkeley, and Emeryville. As has been a theme in the other two systems, theft and vandalism are also a big issue for the operator. You can go to the next slide. Um, to better understand what trends have been happening during the pandemic, we can look at the Bay Wheels data, which is the most thorough data we have in the region. While across the country, there's been this narrative of increasing bike share usage during the pandemic, when looking at the Bay Wheels data, that is only true in the denser urban areas like San Francisco. This graph here looks at the percent change in ridership compared to the same month in 2019, so pre-pandemic. Um, so a zero would be no change, above the zero line is an increase, uh, and below is a decrease. So even in San Francisco, ridership only began to recover to 2019 levels in the summer, fall, and winter of 2021. 
and only as of uh, late spring in 2022 um, has it been increasing above 2019 levels. However, in less dense areas like in the East Bay, ridership has decreased significantly. You'll notice uh, that the East Bay city is hover around 60 to 80% decrease when compared to the same month in 2019. Overall, uh, the Baywell system hasn't recovered yet when looking at the full year, ridership is still down about 20% in 2021. Uh, we wanted to share these trends and insights just to give some additional context to bike share in the region and bring light that, as Dana mentioned, there's still a lot of change in the industry right now. While we recognize that every community and context is different, we hope that this can be useful to understand the regional context of bike share. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so this is uh, an informational item, but we're certainly interested in hearing um, input and comments from the board, and, and we are here for any questions. So with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. I'm looking to see if we have any hands from our board. Director Corsi. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm wondering if if Santa Rosa has any um, data yet on the use of the bird scooters. Uh, I don't have the, the figures at my fingertips, but last update I got was a couple of weeks ago. And I think right now the, the bird scooters were being used about twice per day per scooter. And it, is that considered high, low? average use? I have no answer for you on that. All I can tell you is I have fun zipping in and out of traffic with my helmet on. Okay. Um, so I, I could share about Windsor. I, I don't have the numbers also, but I do know that from when they first got deployed after the review, they put more out because the ridership was increasing around Windsor. So we have more uh, scooters out there than we originally did. Okay. Well, the report- And, on, and that's the case in Santa Rosa as well. Okay, that's good. The report on the bikes is discouraging. Um, and, you know, it, the market is the market. It it, it decides these things. So um, I, I think that, I, I guess I just appreciate the report. I think we need to keep our eye on this and, and see where, where it's going. I just downloaded the bird scooter app, by the way. Well, director, you and I can go for a ride and check out a couple of areas that overlap in our district. You're on. Any other any other questions from the board? Uh, um, I have uh, have a question, Mr. Chair, if it's okay. Um, yep, go for it. Well, it's not really a question, but I have to agree with uh, what um, Supervisor Corsi said. But at the same time, I'm wondering, is that because it's a little bit expensive? Because when we look at the community that we have and um, people don't make enough money to kind of afford that, I'm wondering if it's a budget or finance uh, issue that we are dealing with because I know that those scooters and bikes are really um, uh, good for the community and for what we have been fighting um, while we talk about climate change. So that was a, a little bit my thought and question to all of you here. Yeah, and I'll bring it back to see if there's also any public comment on this item. Um, <clears throat> confirming Chair Rogers, I do not see any members of the public with their hands up on this item. Okay. Uh, I'll agree with Director Corsi. It's uh, disappointing that we haven't been able to get this off the ground, but obviously it's, it's uh, circumstances outside the control of, of SCTA, RCTA, and our local jurisdictions. So hopefully we can get that going. I do hear from folks that, that they like the scooters, that they enjoy the scooters. Uh, but I do hear from other people as well that, that they'd like a bike option uh, to be able to, to work with. Um, we do have some local uh, electric bike companies that uh, perhaps there's a partnership that can be had there. 
uh, per particularly there's there's Pedigo in downtown Santa Rosa. I don't know if that's an option for us to be able to look at um, some kind of sort of partnership with them, um, but I'm open to, to options for sure. Director Kelly. Thank you, Chair Rogers. Um, as other cities were commenting on their scooter program, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, the city of Healdsburg is doing an e-bike share program with Bird. Bird is the scooter company that many of you are using, but we are using them for e-bikes. And that was through a quick strike grant program that we uh, were awarded during uh, the pandemic through SCTA. Uh, we are going, it took a while to get the federal uh, program <laughs> funds in motion, um, but we are going to be deploying those bikes by year end. It's coming before the Healdsburg City Council at our next meeting. And um, I just wanted to share that I think, uh, you know, this was a recommendation. We used to have a bike share program in Healdsburg, but they weren't e-bikes and that company did uh, go under during COVID. It wasn't the, it wasn't Bolt, it was another company, but uh, we ultimately ended up shifting and doing e-bikes because it was a recommendation of, of folks in our community wanting to be able to get further distances at greater ease and go up hills uh, and be more resident centric instead of uh, more visitor centric, which the previous bike program was very uh, tourist centric downtown. So um, I'll, I'm happy to share how that goes, but I think uh, utilizing birds and so many other cities are, are doing that with scooters seems to be a, a potential for uh, the bike share program that you guys were talking about as it relates to smart stations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, director. Anything else from folks? Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to our next item then. It's item 4.6. That's our legislative update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There were just two bills I wanted to, uh, mention one is we've already talked about SB 852 by Senator Dodd that, that um, grants us greater authorities as a climate resilience district. Um, and then the other uh, also by Senator Dodd was SB 1050. That was the tolling legislation for Highway 37, which uh, did not make it out of the Assembly Appropriations Committee. So that bill died um, before it got to the governor's desk. Um, so we are working with our counterparts uh, on Highway 37 program committee uh, to look at what the options are in terms of the existing authority that the California Transportation Commission has for tolling and uh, efforts they actually might pursue for legislative change. But uh, so there's still an opportunity for tolling on the 37 corridor, but it is not um, is not what we had hoped that the, the Dodd legislation would have provided. Uh, so that was, well, there's a lot going on with legislation and federal and state funding programs, um, sort of too much to report out on, but we are trying to suss our way through uh, opportunities there in various different forms. And that's it on that. Any questions from the board on those uh, bills? Let's see if there's any public comment. Uh, <clears throat> confirming Chair Rogers, I do not see any members of the public who wish to speak on this item. Okay. If it's appropriate, Suzanne, should we send a thank you to Senator Dodd for uh, the RCPA bill? Sure. That'd be great. great. Excellent. Let's go ahead and go through our staff reports then. Um, there was no executive committee today, so we have no report on that. Um, I don't know if you want to do regional agency reports. Yeah, let's see if anybody has a regional or agency report that they'd like to report out on. All right, seeing none. All right. So then we've got uh, Ross. Is Ross in? Yes, Ross is in the building. Um, he's got our marketing and communications report. I do. Thank you, directors. Um, I'd like to provide a brief overview of uh, SCTA, RCPA marketing and communications activities since the previous board meeting. Um, as mentioned previously in item 4.1, um, SCTA staff conducted outreach and engagement efforts to gather community feedback on the 2021 funding program selections. 
Um, as proposed in the July engagement plan, SCTA sent physical letters to all Sonoma County tribes and a wide selection of community-based organizations. These letters gave an overview of the proposed funding projects. Staff followed up with emails and phone calls to all letter recipients, offering to provide more information or set up events to explain SCTA project selection to the organization's members. An interactive online survey in English and Spanish was created to collect public responses. A Spanish version of the project list was also created for use with the survey. Responses continue to come in and have been consolidated and posted on the SCTA website. These responses have been provided to staff for consideration uh, for current and future project selection. Engagement will also continue in person at upcoming events, uh, such as the Los Cien event, uh, where a large QR code linking to Spanish and English versions of the survey will be displayed with staff on hand to explain the funding program. The community feedback so far has given insight into local sentiment surrounding project selection choices and has generated valuable conversation with the public regarding future transportation funding in Sonoma County. Um, also, as previously mentioned, um, communication and engagement continued for RCPA's funding for climate change efforts. Um, RCPA staff presented the SEM uh, call to action to Florida Park, Petaluma, and uh, Sebastopol in August, and filming was completed on the video as mentioned before. Um, one exciting thing uh, was uh, SCTA partnered with Caltrans, uh, the Caltrans communications team to organize a ribbon cutting event, uh, celebrating the completion of the HOV lane construction in Sonoma County. Uh, the event took place on August 5th and featured an excellent turnout of project supporters and elected officials. Uh, speakers included um, SETA RCPA Executive Director Suzanne Smith, Caltrans uh, Director Tony Tavares, Congressman Jared Huffman, State Senate Member Mike McGuire, uh, City of Petaluma Vice Mayor Dennis Posike, and Gelati Construction Senior Project Manager Timothy Salas. SETA assisted with inviting local officials and guests, as well as providing copy and information for promotional materials. This project completes all planned US 101 carpool lanes in Sonoma County. Thank you for your time today. Please let me know if I can answer any questions related to outreach, engagement, or communications. All right, directors, any questions for Ross? All right, let's go to public comment. And Drew, I don't see any public comment. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I'm um, confirming I don't see any members of the public wishing to speak on this item. All right, let's go on to our climate change activities report. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to report on the RCPA staff activity since your July meeting. Of course, uh, completing the GHG inventory is our, our highlighted activity and uh, congratulations to BC on an excellent presentation. In addition, staff co uh, continued coordination regarding the countywide tree protection ordinances in collaboration with the Urban Sustainability Directors Network's Natural Climate Solutions Planning Team. Uh, this included the completion of surveys of local jurisdictions and development of recommendations for local ordinances based on model tree protection language that was developed with the assistance from a University of Colorado uh, Boulder graduate student researcher. And there will be a more detailed report on this topic at a future meeting. In addition, staff submitted a pre-proposal uh, to the Strategic Growth Council's Regional Climate Collaboratives grant program to fund community outreach, engagement, and capacity building for the Sonoma Climate Mobilization Call to Action. Staff also hosted several meetings with jurisdiction staff, Sonoma Clean Power, the Sonoma County Energy and Sustainability Division to coordinate efforts on energy efficiency, clean transportation, and carbon sequestration. And in regards to our Bayran activities, our partner ESD completed a home resilience guide that uh, was included as an attachment to this report. This new guide is available in English and Spanish 
and has been shared with the Bay Rim member counties for use in their jurisdictions. It's a very excellent uh, guide for the layperson on the benefits and the process of decarbonizing their household or business. I highly recommend it. And then finally, for the Water Upgrade Safe program, we are currently installing indoor upgrades on our first multifamily project in Sebastopol. And we continue to market to Sebastopol and Cloverdale customers using co-branded letters, social media, and newsletters. And we are preparing to add recirculation pumps and a leak detection repair service to the program. And with that, I'll hand it back. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We'll see if there's any questions from the board. Go to public comment. I'm confirming no hands are raised for public comment. All right. Thank you, Chris. Let's go on to our planning activities report. All right, we got Chris Barney. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm, I'm up on for this today. So just a couple items I'd like to uh, provide an update on. So on the travel modeling side, we're uh, working with MTC and our regional partners on um, becoming more in sync with our modeling, modeling efforts and improving our consistency. Uh, and we've also been trying to get a handle on um, how to represent transportation impacts that we're seeing in COVID. So um, especially you know, the new normal and everything. So Director Bagby, we're, we're looking at that. So hopefully we'll have some more information on that soon. Um, on Vision Zero, um, the data dashboard was updated with 2021 data earlier this summer. And we've been looking at the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program and are looking at potentially trying to get together a grant application for that program um, in the fall of 2023 to implement some of the actions and possibly some projects listed in the Vision Zero Action Plan. Uh, so we have a number of other items on the planning activities report. I know Dana is also online here to answer uh, any questions on those items or other items I may uh, be familiar with. All right, so that's thank my you report, first. Chair. Appreciate it. Let's see if there's any questions or comments from the board. Moving quick. And uh, Drew, let's see about public comment. I'm confirming no members of the public have their hands raised on this item. All right, let's go ahead and go on then to our projects and planning activities report. Thank you, Chair. On the uh, projects and programming activities report, I'll focus on the project since we've had the, the robust item earlier on the programming for our funding plan. Starting down Highway 101 in Petaluma, we still have some surface lifts of asphalt to go down and striping. Folks are enjoying those carpool lanes, but there will be a smoother surface with some better delineation coming up in the near future. Staff is continuing to work with Caltrans on uh, budget issues on that project with some cost overruns. We're scheduled to present some staff recommendations to the SCTA board in October. Also in October, uh, staff plans to bring before the SCTA board a consultant recommendation for a landscaping uh, feasibility study. This is for landscaping from the county line all the way up to Windsor to uh, reevaluate some of those cost estimates and what an implementation plan would look like. This will kick off that feasibility work uh, uh, with consultant selection. Moving over to our State Route 121 at uh, State Route 116 project, uh, the, uh, the consultant there has submitted, uh, it's actually a resubmittal of their 100% design package. Uh, we are, uh, looking at a CTC or California Transportation Commission allocation later this year and to advertise that project to contractors in 2023. We're also working very closely with that consultant and Caltrans on the delivery of the project um, due to uh, design support budget funding constraints that uh, we're encountering now. Lastly, I'll uh, direct you in your board packet today to a consent item, which did approve funding for State Route 121 at 8th Street. 
Uh, that, that also includes a contract with Caltrans to do oversight on the project initiation document or the PID document. And uh, we did do, conduct a uh, consultant um, RFP for that as well, which will be coming to the board in October and kick off that uh, PID document at State Route 121 and 8th Street. With that, that concludes the uh, verbal report for the projects and programming activities. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, James. Does anybody have any questions? All right, Drew, let's see if there's any public comment. I'm confirming no members of the public have their hands raised on this item, Chair Rogers. All right, then let's go ahead and see if we have any announcements from the board for the good of the body. I'll start with Director Gurney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the good of the body. I wanna give you some really fun statistics from the Gravenstein Apple Fair. This relates to all of our efforts under SB 1383, as well as our greenhouse gas emission statistics that we heard earlier. Uh, the Gravenstein Apple Fair happened about a month ago at our County Park Wrangell Ranch. And get this, I worked on the, with the green team at the eco table where we had people sort all the kinds of whatever waste they had from their activity that wonderful day at the fair. The organics from 2019, the last active year of the festival, the organics were up from 6,000 to 7,000 pounds of pig food. So we're cleaning up that stream there and feeding those pigs, all right. Uh, the landfill down from eight cubic yards in 2019 to three cubic yards of garbage. I think that's remarkable. There are a lot more fun statistics, but those are the significant ones from 1383. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, Director. It's exciting. Let's go to Suzanne. Sorry to horn in on the director side of things, but I just want, I've just had a quick announce, or a couple of things I wanted to announce uh, for the board. One, um, it was mentioned during the, the funding program item that we didn't have a quorum for the Citizens Advisory Committee. And the chair asked me to just um, let the board know that we struggle with quorum issues at the CAC. Um, not necessarily appointments. We don't have too many vacancies. We have a few, but not too many, uh, but it's more of an attendance issue. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that. We are um, going to be having a discussion with the CAC about ways in which to address that because I think it's a frustration for those who do attend and don't have it as a, you know, sort of formal vote. Um, so we'll be back to you with some potential options if there needs to be some amendments to the administrative code or something else. But um, the membership is included as part of the agenda packet along with the um, the agendas for each of those meetings. So if you see any of those folks, ask them if they're attending their CAC meeting. Um, and then the other thing is just for planning ahead, uh, we are planning a board meeting in October and one in December, but uh, it looks like we will, we're proposing to cancel the November board meeting. Um, there's a conference that staff is planning to attend, but there's also, often not enough for November and December. So we're hoping to, to skip November and just hold the meetings in October and December to close out the year. That's it for me, Mr. Chair. All right. Anybody else with anything? All right, then we'll adjourn at five o'clock. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>